because maybe some of you have heard uh, Country Mart is, has been bought out by Price Chopper. And so when, uh, and so Easter Sunday, I guess Country Mart's gonna close or that'll be their last day and then they'll reopen in two weeks as Price Chopper. They're gonna do some remodeling or whatever. So when we talk about the inventory at Country Mart right now, what are we talking about? It's dwindling, yeah, their inventory is dwindling. And what is their inventory? <coughs> Put it into words, what, what am I talking about? The inventory at Country Mart. Product on the shelves, right? So pretty much product on the shelves, meat in the freezer, you know, all of that stuff, that is their inventory. And so using that kind of helps motivate what we're doing here for the macro economy, thinking about, well, what about all the producers? Walmart, department stores, maybe even wholesalers for that matter, when they think about the orders that they're getting. We're thinking about the, the relationship between inventory that's ready to sell versus inventory that actually sells, right? And so we got this process of going through production and holding the inventory and then selling the inventory. So GDP is the dollar value of all final goods and services produced within the nation's boundaries over the course of the year. C plus I plus G plus X is our cigarettes, and I has inventories in it. And once those inventories are sold, it transfers over to C. So if we think about Y equals C plus I plus G plus X, the amount of GDP in a given year contains the unsold inventory over here plus the sold inventory over here. And so it kind of transfers from one spot to the next. One spot to the next, which means that the level of income for that particular uh, product remains unchanged with the exception of the valuing of that inventory. And so if we have a markup with that um, and the actual sale price differs from what we had on the books at cost, because when we hold it at inventory, we're holding the product at cost uh, on our books, and now we have that bump up to C. So there's a little bit of a fluctuation there. All right, so the model that we put together was thinking about planned spending called aggregate expenditures. And here is planned aggregate expenditures, or AE aggregate expenditures, we defined that last time. And down here is our production. So for this example, you can think about this being production or income, slash income. It's kind of helpful because depending on what we're doing, we might think of it one way or the other as it relates to spending. For the inventory analysis we did, we put in a 45 degree line. Why was that significant? Why was the 45 degree line significant? Yeah, it, it's where it intersects it. What's happening along the whole thing though? Like if I think of any old point along here, What's true about this 45 degree reference line? Good, it's all points where planned spending equals production or income equals spending, right? So in equilibrium, the idea is whatever the aggregate income for the nation is, is what we ultimately had in planned spending which is all of these four components. Spending in one way, shape, or form. Whether it was spending by government, spending by business, spending by households. Uh, at the end of the day, we expect the, um, that to be true in equilibrium. And so yes, where this, these two lines cross, we had production and or income equaling our spending. And so we had AE here. Let's call it AE1 and Y1. Yeah, let, let's just, let's kind of put that into words because I think I showed the shape. So that, that's a, 
decent spot to maybe go here. If we're at, if the economy happened to be here, if the level of production was, was here, we'd be at a point, so we're kind of explaining disequilibrium at this point. So at Y2, our production exceeds our planned spending. So production exceeds spending, and then we can think about what's happening to inventories. So at Y2, um, production is greater than spending. Production is greater than spending. Because this is our planned spending line. Remember, this is planned spending. So now businesses start to see inventories going up or down. Up, right? So now they've been ordering on the phone, but people aren't coming and buying in, into their store. And so they're seeing the stock on the shelves growing. So at Y2, there's an increase in inventory. And this ends up signaling to the business. So this signals business to decrease production or their orders, depending on what type of story we're talking about. If we're a wholesaler and we see that our inventories are climbing, we're like, oh, well, maybe we should lay off a few people or you know, cool our jets here this week because we've got plenty on the shelves to ride this thing out for a while, right? So we're gonna decrease production and then that's the first um, uh, area of the economy that might be affected by a downswing in activity. Okay, so an increase in inventory leads to a decrease in production, which trying to argue why we'd end up back to this point. At Y3, we have just the opposite going on. We're spending AE2, I guess, if I got this here. So at Y3, production is less than our spending. And that causes a decrease in inventory, which leads to an increase in production. So the thing to note here is that this is a story of why we believe point A, which I haven't drawn up there, point A is equilibrium. Any other level of output isn't stable. And so this is going to lead us to point A being our equilibrium. Questions on that? All right, so now we get into to, to some interesting situations here of, of um, what happens when there's a change in spending. So what happens when there is a change in autonomous spending. Which is a change in G, 
or maybe a change in I. We're going to do a change in G because that's kind of the focus of the chapter is to think about, well, what if the government just spends some more money? You know, what, what's, what's the impact? <coughs> okay, so um, so let's do an example. Um, suppose that there is an increase in government spending of $50 billion. So we're going to buy some weapons of mass destruction. Maybe we're thinking we can go help out the Ukraine and fight those Russians back. I just don't think it's fair. So, example. Suppose... Uh, there's an increase in government spending of 50 billion bucks. So what I want to do is kind of track that movement, track that movement through, uh, through society here. And so we're going to look at the rounds of spending. So there's an increase of 50 million. And what happens to total expenditures? Let me put change in G here. 50 million. What is the change in total expenditures? Let me put AE here instead of TEM switching the notation. So if we go to our equation here, what happens if we increase this by 50 billion? We'll just keep it a closed economy right now and not worry about exports. What happens to spending if I bump it up by 50? It goes up by 50, right? So the government goes out. Now we can go back to real life here. Obama signs a check for 50 billion, gives it to some weapons manufacturer, and now there's $50, $50 billion that was just spent, right? So that goes up. So we have a $50 billion increase there, which then, what does the weapons manufacturer do with it? What does the weapons manufacturer do with the money? They run their, what's that? He buys his own yacht. Buys his own yacht. That could be somewhere down the line in the equation. What else do they need to buy besides padding their pockets for some weapons? The resource, right? So they start spending that money. They have people to hire. They've got contracts to make. They might have other subcontractors. And so, this leads to a change in income of $50 million. Now notice the transformation that went on here, right? We had spending now turning into somebody else's income. Somebody got a paycheck. The steel manufacturer that has all the steel that's used in the AK-47s, they just got part of that paycheck, right? So now they're generating income off of this 50 billion. What do they do with it? Let's be you working for the weapons manufacturer. You just got a paycheck. What do you do with it? Spend it. How much of it? How much? 90%. Why do you say that? Okay, you save 10%. Does everybody save 10%? No. But on average, we talked about the breakdown at the aggregate level that we could take what people do on average. And so if on average, the marginal propensity to consume is uh, 90%, 0.9, then that income's going to turn into somebody else's spending. Let's see, where do I want to drop this in on here? Yeah, let's, let's drop it in here. Um, to the tune of, 
what? Using Sawyer's 90%, what's the new amount of spending that's going to go on here? 45. Good. So now we have another round of spending. And so what's going on here is that we've got kind of a new change in consumption column. You guys can sneak in here. It started off with the 50 change, and now it's in here. And so now they ran to Applebee's and had themselves a new uh, steak dinner with their new outfit they got. I haven't seen the remodeling. Anybody go in there and see the remodeling? Is it pretty nice? Is it really different? Or is it more the outside? Or is it it's the inside. Modernized inside. Okay, so we go to Applebee's, we spend the money, and so now we're kind of kicking into what we did before, where there's a change in aggregate expenditures of 45. Applebee's gets the money in their cash register. Applebee's pays their food suppliers. Their food suppliers, their workers end up getting their paycheck. They go run to Walmart and spend 90% of it. So now we've got kind of spending building on it, on each other. And so now we've got, uh, let's see, what are we doing here? $4.50. <coughs> so we've got uh, 40, 50. So this is 90%. Remember the marginal propensity to consume we're assuming here is 0.9. The Walmart pays their employees, right? So we get 40, 50. That turns into somebody else's paycheck. That money turns into 90% and so on and so on and so on. So we get $50 billion initiated by the government going to the weapons company starting to filter into the economy and turning into more and more spending. Right? That's the multiplier effect. That's the spending multiplier. <coughs> All right, questions on that so far? Graphically, the amount of the change would be shown as a shift up of the aggregate expenditure line. So this little change here is the change in G equal to 50 billion. So we're gonna shift up by 50 billion, vertical shift here of 50. All right, so now, using my 45 degree line, I can kind of see something going on here. These two line segments would be equal, right? If I drew them real carefully. Up 50, over 50. But the new place for the economy is over here, capturing that multiplier. So the change in income, the change in final output, has two effects to it. One coming from the change in the initial change of the 50 billion, and the other, this multiplier effect. So the change in Y ends up being much greater than that. So we've got a change in government spending leading to a change in output. We could put together a little Excel spreadsheet and calculate the addition of all these numbers, right? Because we got 45, oh wait, first of all we got 50. 50 plus 45 is 95. 95 plus 40 dollars and 50 cents, right? And so we keep adding those up to get this multiplier effect. So let me write some of that out here. So we've shown it graphically, we've shown it with the equation. So we've got the um, autonomous spending multiplier. The change in output is equal to 
1 over 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume times the change in spending. I'm just going to put G here, but it's really any sort of autonomous spending. So a mathematician kind of noticed the similarities, right? We got 1 over the RRR, that whole money multiplier effect. Very similar thing going on here mathematically. We just got the change change in excess reserves times 1 over that. So this is the simple spending multiplier. The simple spending multiplier. The reason it's simple is that we made a bunch of assumptions on it. And this is the any change in autonomous <coughs> spending. And this, of course, is the final effect, the final change in real GDP. And you can see why this might get politicians excited, is that if we take 1 over 1 minus the MPC, we get 1 over 1 minus 0 0.9 times the 50, which is 1 over 0 0.1. So the multiplier is 10. I get 10 times 50 is 500. So I can really take the economy out of the doldrums here. I can just go spend some money on some weapons and boom, recession's gone. Now doesn't that just sound too easy? But economists kind of have that simplistic thought running through their heads from the time Keynes came up with it in 1936 time frame all the way up into probably the <laughs> 60s. So when we made it through some of the wars, everything was very mechanical. We just have an economist, yes, this is the simple spending multiplier, and, and we're gonna, we'll talk about some things that make it not so simple, but at the end of the day, it's something we can calculate. It's something we can kind of help steer the economy in different directions. All right, so questions on that so far? All right, so what do you think taxes do to it? Remember I had, the, this was a, in our no tax world. So if we have taxes, what's going to happen to that multiplier? So here, by the way, the multiplier, we'd say that the, the simple multiplier is 10. So we just take that number of spending, we multiply it times 10, and that gives you the final effect. <coughs> It's going to reduce it, right? So if we are taking taxes away from that spending, then it's going to be less money at each level as we go down, right? So, um, so a simple multiplier, simple multiplier um, does not include. One taxes. And taxes are going to make the real multiplier smaller. So this makes the real world multiplier smaller. We also operated in a closed economy. And what if we open it up to the rest of the world? It also ignores imports. If we open the world up to trade, what is including imports going to do to our equation? Is that going to increase or decrease this multiplying concept? 
So we're importing stuff from other countries, from the rest of the world. Would that tend to increase or decrease that little chain of events that we work through in terms of the size of the multiplier? The money's going outside the United States, yeah. So part of what, what makes that multiplier that big is that the money's staying within the United States. So if we start sending our spending over to China, it's exiting our system. It doesn't have a chance for the Applebee's uh, labor to go spend money at Walmart, right? We're taking away that chunk if we're sending the spending overseas. So. If we include imports into this, <clears throat> this makes, makes the real world smaller, the real world multiplier <clears throat> smaller. And you can think of it as that the spending goes to China. The spending leaves the USA. And so we don't have that spending, getting spending, that multiplication process of, of spending going on. <clears throat> All right. Um, I, uh, I kind of blew that. All right, whatever. <laughs> so here's what. Uh, Here's our answer. Just to, the, I'm, I'm not even going to go. Sometimes I go through in class the, the algebra of this, and I'm going to skip this this time. So um, I'm going to cut to the chase. See, as much fun as I think it is to you know, do a few mental gymnastics on that. But, uh, so the real world multiplier is the change in output equals one over one minus the slope of the aggregate expenditure line times the change in G. <clears throat> when we built this thing originally, you might remember that we started off with the marginal propensity to consume. as part of the uh, slope of this. So when we did it originally, the simple one, the simple is uh, slope equal to the marginal propensity to consume. And therefore, our definition was 1 over 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume. So all we're going to do is say, hey, <clears throat> Whatever the slope of this thing is, the concepts all work the same. And it's a complex formula that involves your marginal propensity to import goods as well as the tax rate that you're facing. Right? So it's gonna it's gonna be some ugly creature. And if you guys, I know we got a few math people in here, if you really are into this, go to your appendix and it'll derive the multiplier when you in, include taxes and um, imports. All right, so uh, so let's see how this thing maps up with our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. Before I do that, let me make or write down so you have it in your notes a couple things. Um, so even though it's smaller, it's something. So this is kind of a politician's dream. Spend money, spend money, and have bigger bang for the economy. And that was, I mean, in short, the policy prescription coming out of World War II. It's like, oh, this is awesome. And so now we've got this kind of spend, spend, spend. 
So now, what we're going to explore is the long run implications. Question mark. So for this, I want to draw, oh, let me see. I didn't want to go side by side. I want to go up and down. So draw a nice big graph for yourself that's got two graphs stacked on top of each other. The one up top is the one we just got done doing, <laughs> the aggregate expenditure model. Kind of helps, by the way, if you draw the AE line kind of flat. <coughs> and then draw that 45 degree line. And here we're measuring real GDP. And we think that the equilibrium would be right here where the economy would be going here at Y1 and AE1. <laughs> so there's our bare naked model, our starting place. Downstairs, we're gonna go back to the goods market. So we've got the price level being measured on the vertical axis and real GDP as usual on the horizontal axis. <laughs> and the first thing I want to do is connect up these Y's. So Y1 right here is the same thing as Y1 down here. And furthermore, let's say that we're in a long run equilibrium. And so let's make that the location of our long run aggregate supply curve. Then fill in the rest of the story. We'll say that uh, we've got an aggregate demand curve somewhere. Let's put this all in long run equilibrium as well. We've got a short run aggregate supply curve. All three lines cross right about here at a price level of 100 just for fun. If you want to, you can change this to the potential level of real GDP. So that was our status quo from chapter 10 for the goods market. All right, so now let's do the Keynesian prescription and let's help stimulate the economy and shift up the aggregate <laughs> expenditure line to G2. So let's, let's say that government spending was G1 just to be kind of generic down here and then we purchased some weapons of mass destruction and government spending went up. Same scenario we just went through. <coughs> that multiplier effect kicks in and we would predict that the economy would move out to here. Same story we just told. What we didn't tell was what was going on down here, the baseline assumption. And one of the assumptions was that the price level was consistent. We were holding all of the things constant, things like the prices of goods on the shelves at Country Mart and Walmart. So when you bring this down here, you go dot, 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 dot. If there's an increase in G, what did that do down here? What did it shift? The aggregate demand curve. To the right or to the left? To the right, right? So an increase in government spending. Holding this price level constant is why I did that. You can put a big dot right there and then do some sort of parallel shift doesn't have to be parallel, but we'll just assume it to be to here. And so this aggregate demand curve was <laughs> similarly at government spending G1, and now the government's spending more money, they've ramped things up to G2. 
this is the level of output that the multiplier, even the fancy multiplier if we want to go there, this is the level of output that the multiplier would predict would be that we'd crank out to y1. But is that where we're going to go if we if there's an impact on the price level? Is that where the economy is going to go? Are we going to make it out here? No. So if there's a price level effect, which there's no reason to believe there wouldn't be, the economy would move up to this point, which would put us at the real level here of, let's just call it Y2. All right, so now we're blending what we learned in chapter 10 with this chapter 11 concept, trying to see if this Keynesian multiplier thing, where it's all going. So remember, we started at point A, similar to what we did in chapter 10. We believe that the economy in the short run is going to go to point B if what's going on with prices? Is that what? Held constant. Which ones are held constant? So we got the price level going up, by the way, potentially to, let's call it 103, just to motivate some numbers here. Which prices are going up? What type of prices are going up for the economy to expand from A to B in the first place? We have that important distinction. We're moving along the, social, the short run aggregate supply curve. What was held constant along it? Wages, good, who said that? Is that Sean back there? All right, that's worth an extra credit point. Wages, good. So with wages held constant, I don't have a thinner marker here, Sean. I can't even read that, all right. <laughs> if wages are being held constant at $10 an hour, just to kind of motivate things like we did before, We've got prices on the shelves at Walmart going up. Output prices go up 3%, but wages don't. Is that sustainable in the long run? No. Price, there's going to be upward pressure in the labor market. The concept we went through is that output prices tend to lead input prices, right? So output prices change, and then eventually wages need to change too. There's that lag time. Milton Friedman didn't think that that lag time was very long. Keynes thought in the long run we are all dead. He thought, well, that's a long time from now, so let's not, let's not wait around for it. All right, I can see we are a little bit late today. I guess that's a good enough spot. We'll 